Good morning! My name is Mary Elliott and I will be giving you the lecture on enzymes, physiology of the heart, liver, and muscle. First we're going to start with the heart and heart pathology and I have some special guests that are going to explain to you about how the heart works. Please Hannah and Eli, take it away. Hi, I'm Dr. Hannah and this is Inside Body. Dr. Eli, who's going to be our body today. First, we're going to talk about the heart. The heart is what pumps blood through your body. It takes so one no minute for it to pump the blood all the way it. around your body. Show her what the muscles look like. There is four chambers inside the heart. One, two, three, four. There's this little right here too. Uh, these are all the things, all these holes are for pumping the blood pump. around. If you didn't have a heart, you would die. <coughs> these blue things are veins. veins. These red things are arteries. Artery. And this is probably the one that pumps blood all around the body. Nope. It goes from the lungs to the heart. And it goes from here to here. And don't forget to. This is the inside of the heart, too. And this, this is a loving And heart. that's the outside. Now we're going to talk about the liver. The liver. This is your liver. It's located right above your stomach. And Don't your forget stomach. to do the level to filters to out water. And get Don't forget to do some all the wine. germs in poison. Just one minute. Poison. poison. Got rid of all the germs and poison. And that's going to be about it for Don't today. To I hope you enjoy. Don't forget to buy and make sure to subscribe. Thank you, Hannah and Eli, for that very nice explanation of the heart and liver. The heart is a muscle, or you may already know this. It is an organ. It pumps venous blood through the right atrium and ventricle to the lungs where it is oxygenated and sent to the left atrium and ventricle and through the body. Cardiovascular disease is a term that can mean a variety of disease states. Heart attack, angina is chest pain. Congestive heart failure is more of a long-term problem where the pressures in the heart don't work right. Um, some people can be asymptomatic for this. Some people can have chest pain. Heart valve problems, these are typically congenital and you get them at birth. We see a lot of these here at Akron Children's Hospital. And arrhythmias is where your heart does not beat the way it should. It might have a rhythm that's not pump, 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 but like pump, 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 pump something like that. So I took the statistics from the American Heart Association. Um, this is their, from their 2021 update. So the age adjusted death rate attributable to cardiovascular disease based on 2018 data, a little old, um, is 217.1 per 100,000 in the population. So it's pretty, that's pretty significant. A lot of people die of heart attacks. So it's really important to make sure that as a laboratory we get the results that the doctors need and we get that put out there quickly. On average, someone dies of a cardiovascular disease every 36 seconds in the United States and there are 2,380 deaths from CVD each day. 
On average, someone dies of a stroke every three minutes and 33 seconds in the US, and there are about 405 deaths from stroke each day based on this data. Uh, stroke isn't really something we're gonna cover in this lecture, but it does involve the arteries. That's why I left it that there. All coronary vascular disease starts with atherosclerosis, and this is an inflammatory process that hardens the blood vessel. So the basic definition is a disease of the arteries characterized by the deposition of plaque of fatty material on their inner walls. Originally, they thought this was from lipid deposits in the arteries and struck the lipid deposits. However, um, after more research, doctors and scientists have realized that it's not just lipids deposited on artery walls. I have a handout because there was a really good continuing education that I did through Media Lab, which is something all Akronshon's employees have access to. We keep all of our records on it and it has some continuing education that we have to do. You will eventually have to do continuing education once you graduate to keep your certificate uh, valid. So um, Tracy, I think, printed it for me. So if you could look at this handout and I will go over that with you. Atherosclerosis is the leading cause of cardiovascular disease in the United States. It is an inflammatory process of the arterial vessels, and this happens over years and years and years. Lipid particles in the immune system lead to inflammation in the vessel wall. And then inflammatory cytokines, macrophages, lipids, and lipoproteins create foam cells. And these foam cells are deposited, as you can see, um, I have a little visual there, on the arterial wall. And over time, um, these foam cells damage the arterial wall, damage, damage, damage. And eventually you get this plaque, as you can see on the slide here. Um, the plaque is due to cell injury or bacterial infection, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, and so on and so forth. Many things you can read on your handout here. Um, so the damage to the cell wall attracts white blood cells, monocytes and lymphocytes. I don't know if you've had hematology yet, maybe not, it's only August. So these are various types of white blood cells that you'll learn more about at a later date. But and all you need to know is that they are attracted to the site. And then macrophages are also attracted to the site and they, um, macrophages like to eat damaged cells or bacteria, they're like cleanup crew. So they eat these lipoproteins and it makes them foamy. And macrophage is a really kind of a pretty cell, but they can get um, grown little white dots in them and it makes it look kind of lacy, like lace or foam. And this creates a cascade of inflammatory response. Important to note here because this is a test that you can do to see if a person may be at risk for atherosclerosis is that myeloperoxidase is an enzyme and it is released by the macrophages in the white blood cells. <clears throat> that have died. So uh, this, if that's increased, um, we'll get to that later, but that is a good indication that maybe someone has atherosclerosis or is at risk for it. Over time, as you can see, the um, plaque forms and you form a fibrous cap. And this fibrous cap can grow and grow, and eventually it will occlude the whole artery or a lot of the artery. And this is what leads to acute myocardial infarction, um, angina, the whole list of coronary problems. I have another handout with some other excellent information. This was a really good CE. I feel like um, you could just 
log into Media Lab and do the CE, I wouldn't have to give that lecture. Hold on. Okay, one word I did not go over that you need to know is ischemia, which means tissue damage. It can be any tissue, heart, liver, lung, any tissue in the body. Ischemia means tissue damage. So acute coronary syndrome, I'm just gonna read it. This syndrome is a broader term that includes all ischemic events that can occur in the heart. Ischemia is defined simply as inadequate blood supply to an organ, in this case, the heart. These ischemic events range from angina, which is chest pain, there's no cell death and or reversible cell injury, to an AMI with large areas of cell necrosis or dead heart cells. A continuum of events that are involved in acute coronary syndrome um, is illustrated on this page. Angina is the first step, it's chest pain. Uh, it's just caused by an inadequate supply of oxygen to the heart. Then um, from there, we've got acute myocardial infarction. This is also called a heart attack. This is a sudden loss of blood flow um, and thus oxygen to the muscle tissue of the heart. This causes necrosis or decaying, dying of heart tissue. And it was often caused by the narrowing of coronary arteries due to atherosclerosis or thrombus. A thrombus is a clot. So that is why I went over atherosclerosis. That is what leads to the heart attacks. Um, sometimes people have, <clears throat> you know, a bypass and they will um, take an artery and bypass the artery that is closed off. Double bypass, they chew, and so forth. And then there is congestive heart failure. Is usually a left ventricle dysfunction resulting from aging, hypertension, atherosclerosis, or damage from an AMI. The heart is not able to effectively pump its blood through its chambers in the rest of the body. Fluid accumulates in the lungs and tissues causing edema, swelling, because less blood leaves to the arteries than entered in through the veins. The EKG, uh, this is something doctors will use to diagnose heart attacks. It's um, you come in with chest pain, you usually get an EKG. Sometimes if you don't have chest pain, they give you an EKG. And this is an electrocardiogram. These terms refer to the tracings of electrical currents that pass through the myocardium. The heart contractions are stimulated by this current. In areas of myocyte necrosis, the current does not pass through normally and the tracings will reflect this with abnormal patterns. <clears throat> Infarction is an area of tissue death that occurs due to lack of oxygen. Like I said before, clogging of an artery will cause dead muscle tissue or infarction. Uh, here is the continuum of events for a heart attack. First, you've got your chest pain, reversible tissue injuries. So that means you have some injury in your heart, but it, it can be fixed. Then unstable chest pain. So you have, might have some slight heart damage. Then we get to myocardial infarction, which can be life-threatening if not treated right away, or even then it could be life-threatening, to extreme tissue necrosis where the heart uh, dies. Coronary heart disease, I say before, is the leading cause of death in the US. It is also synonymous with coronary artery disease. Arteries cannot deliver enough blood to the heart due to plaque buildup. It is often asymptomatic until it progresses into a heart attack. And I believe this is uh, very common in women. So women need to be very careful because women don't have the same symptoms as men for heart attacks. Ours are more mild and we just put things off because that's what we do. Myocardial infarction is myocardial ischemia that exceeds the clinical threshold, resulting in irreversible myocardial cell death and damage. So <clears throat> to diagnose a myocardial infarction, this is what I have as textbook. And I'm gonna go over this with you and I have some more interesting information to tell you. So diagnosis is an alteration in troponin, 
symptoms of ischemia of cell death, new STT segment changes. This uh, has to deal with your EKG. So that's not really something you will deal with in the laboratory. Imaging, maybe a CAT scan, MRI, also not something we really deal with in the laboratory. And then identification of intracoronary thrombus, which that is something that you will learn about in coagulation. They would do a D-dimer, but I'm not gonna explain that here. So this is not going to be on your slides. I have some extra information for you. I have a friend who is a physician at Good Samaritan Hospital. That is a hospital in Cincinnati. Her name is Dr. Allison Finley. She works in the emergency department there. And I wanted to make sure I was giving you the most up-to-date information, especially since I work in a pediatric hospital and we don't really see heart attacks. We see kids that have heart problems with high troponins, but it's not necessarily a heart attack. So I wanted to declare with her what she does when she has a patient coming in with an acute myocardial infarction. I was going to interview you, her and put it on this video, but we really just had a conversation and I didn't record it. So I'm just going to tell you what she said. She told me her laboratory actually has point of care testing in the ER and they do troponins as point of care testing. That's not something we do here at Akron Children's. Our troponins are upstairs. Samples have to be tubed to us, but in her hospital, they have troponins in the ER run immediately. She said it takes about an hour to get results back, but if she has a good lab tech working, it can take 20 minutes. So the important thing there when you're a lab tech is to know that troponin measures for heart attack and to get it done fast, pretty much. Once you're done with school and you're done with your test and you've passed and you have a job, if you're in an adult hospital and you run troponins, the thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is get those done fast. You're not gonna to have to remember much else about it, honestly, but get it done fast. Multitask, prioritize those quickly so the doctors can have the results. Anyways, in her laboratory, they have high sensitivity troponin, whereas here we have troponin T, uh, which is fine for a pediatric hospital, really, because we don't see heart attacks. Very rarely we see heart attacks. Um, so the high sensitivity troponin is pretty cool in that it can be elevated one to two hours of having chest pain or having a heart attack, whereas a regular troponin could take um, anywhere from four to eight. Allison has seen it take eight hours. And then the high sensitivity troponin, she only has to do one, the initial one, and then one two hours later to see how it's developing. A regular troponin, she does one initially and one six hours later. So high sensitivity is definitely a benefit if you are in adult hospital. Maybe a lot of adult hospitals have a high sensitivity already and we don't because we're peds. We actually just got troponin on board in-house maybe a year, two years ago. It's been a long time where we would just send those out and not even run them in-house. Okay, so that, that part is not on a slide. Okay, so I have this diagram here of a left ventricle cavity and a right ventricle cavity. As you can see, um, it has various parts of ischemia. There's some that's just hours old, some that's days old, and some that has been healed. It's just an interesting diagram to see what the heart would look like. Cardiac ischemia. The cardiac muscle is relatively resistant. It takes 20 to 30 minutes to see the beginning of cell death. The longer duration of ischemia, the more cell death. After about three hours of ischemic events, 80% of the cells die. In six hours, 100% of the cells die. Early recognition of persistent ischemia is important to allow intervention and restore the blood flow. Interventions could be a cabbage, a stent, or a thrombolytic therapy if the culprit was a clot and not um, a plaque. So 
there are a lot of risk factors for coronary artery disease. Smoking is a big one, high blood pressure, family history, increased age, obesity, diabetes, and a sedentary lifestyle. So an optimal cardiac biomarker would be one that is highly specific for the heart. Uh, in the history of laboratory testing for heart markers, then we have used a variety of things, but now troponin, high sensitivity troponin specifically, is what we use to determine this. And a good test is both very sensitive and specific for the organ needed. And the enzyme that we would test for is released quickly after ischemia, like the high sensitivity troponin, you have one to two hours and you, you have a high result. And it has a very low concentration in a normal population. It will, should remain in your blood for enough time that you could test it. For example, you have myoglobin, but that degrades quickly. But troponin could be positive for up to two weeks post-infarction. And you would want something that has few interfering substances. Like an interfering substance could be a drug that would um, falsely elevate or falsely decrease hemolysis, uh, bilirubin, Teric is what high bilirubin would be called, or lipemic specimen. You would want something that can be run without too much worry of, oh, that might be high because it was hemolyzed. And you want the plasma concentration of it directly related to the extent of the ischemia. So if you have a high plasma concentration, that means you have a lot of ischemia happening. If you have a low plasma concentration, you have less, and that helps the doctors determine what path they're going to take. There are many lab tests that can test for heart disease, but the best one available right now is troponin for acute problems. But I made a list of all the different ones that we're gonna cover. You have troponin, N-type BNP, CKMB, which this one is really becoming obsolete. CK, same boat, high sensitivity CRP, homocysteine, myeloperoxidase, which remember we talked about with the foam cells, and LPPLA2. I'm going to start with troponin. Troponin is, regulates muscle contraction in the heart. There are three different types of troponin. There's troponin C, which has a calcium binding component. Troponin I has an inhibitory component. And troponin T has a tropomyosin binding component. Here is a diagram of the different types of troponins. The calcium binds to your troponin, which is a thin filament, and this triggers the muscle force. As the calcium rises intracellularly, so inside the cells, the muscles contract. As the calcium falls inside the cells, the muscles relax. Uh, troponins are found in fast twitch skeletal muscles and heart muscles. Troponin I and troponin T are specific for heart muscles. So most facilities will test for tr either troponin I or troponin T. However, there's only one laboratory test manufacturer that makes troponin T. Uh, troponins are superior to CKMB in diagnosing heart damage due to their high specificity for heart tissue. They are used by most physicians to assess the myocyte injury and is very important, as I said before, your for turnaround times to be fast. Cardiac troponin I. This one is a very good indicator of an acute myocardial infarction because it is very specific to the heart. It is released relatively quickly in three to four hours post heart injury. However, as my friend physician said, it could be as far as six to eight hours. So the high sensitivity troponin is still better. It can stay in your bloodstream for three to seven days, so it stays high for a while, and even sometimes 14 days post the AMI. And it can be increased when other biomarkers are not, such as CK. It can also be increased if your EKG is normal. So that makes it a good diagnostic tool 
and if they're having trouble deciding what the patient has, the EKG isn't giving anything specific and the patient has chest pain and the troponin comes up high, well then they know that they're looking at a heart attack or some sort of other ischemic heart event. Now this chart here that has the uh, various enzymes that could come up positive in a heart attack. And it tells you at the bottom, the days after the onset of an infarction and how high the test gets. So as you can see, uh, troponin can spike really high and it lasts a little bit longer than C can be. Myoglobin is a really very quick, rapid spikes is gone. Uh, so troponin is really the better test because it's better to positive longer and it's positive quicker. Myoglobin is kind of a tricky test. So we don't really do that one. I'll get into that later. Oh, moving on. Ha, got it. Okay, so we're gonna talk about creatinine kinase, or CK. This test isn't really used in determining heart ischemia so much anymore. So my friend, uh, Dr. Finley, she doesn't use it at all to determine if there's an AMI. She will do it for rhabdomyolysis, but that's about it. But I believe this is still on your boards, so you do need to know this. There are three isoenzymes, and they're all distinguishable by electrophoresis. Um, it's a dimer of two units, M and B. So CK1, BB, and you can remember B for brain. That one is found mostly in the brain. CK2, MB, which is found in heart and skeletal muscle. So if that comes up positive, it could be for a heart attack or it could be for something wrong in muscles, crushing injury, rhabdomyolysis, something like that. So it's not as specific as say a troponin is for heart. So troponin is a much better way to go. CK3 MM is mostly in muscle. So you can see what the percentage is here. So CK will be increased in all ischemia of muscle, heart, and brain. And you would want to perform the isoenzymes to determine which of the organs has the ischemia. However, this is outdated for cardiac issues, and I have never seen a CKBB or CKMM ordered. I don't know if it's because I work in a pediatric hospital. I have worked at an adult hospital for a little bit, and I still didn't see it ordered. So take that for what you will. Uh, so this is an additional slide about CKBB. Uh, it's found in the serum, but it's not uh, high prevalence in the serum. And CKMM makes up most of the circulating CK in your serum. And skeletal muscle is a source of all CKMB that is circulating in the serum of normal individuals. So that would mean that um, if it was from the heart, like heart CKMB is not normally in your blood, just skeletal muscle CKMB. Historically, uh, they detected CKMB by electrophoresis. Now it is detected by immunoassays. CKMB does rise quickly after a myocardial infarction and it elevates around two to six hours as the peak levels. I mean, in peaks at 12 to 24 hours after the heart attack and decreases slowly after 24 hours. And you can refer back to that chart that I showed you a little bit ago. So the immunometric assay for CKMB detects the B subunit with a specific antibody. This is useful because CKBB is not normally seen in the blood, and this test is done in less than an hour. It's an hour, I'd say, like, less than 30 minutes, but could be wrong. And it's not really specific, um, just some, as I said before. CKMB per B percent 
it is supposed to help to distinguish cardiac from other muscle releases, but this isn't really used much anymore either because we have the troponins and the high sensitivity troponins. So you can uh, memorize the formula so you know it, something you should know just for your test, but in real life, this isn't what we use anymore. And then here is a graph of the electrophoretic mobilities of the various CKs. And then here are the enzymes for chest pain, heart attacks, and it's a really good chart of how they increase. And you can take a look at that. Moving on to B-type neutrotic peptide. A patient with congestive heart failure will exhibit signs and symptoms that are somewhat nonspecific, such as edema, hypertension, shortness of breath, and weakness. Until recently, the diagnosis was difficult and there was a lot of ruling out of other things like renal failure because renal failure has similar symptoms. But introducing BNP is now routinely measured to, to diagnose congestive heart failure. So pro-BNP is the cursor of BNP and is released from the left ventricle of the heart in response to a mechanical stretch. The heart is not always thought of as a hormone producing organ, but occasionally it is. Pro-BNP is produced and released by the heart in response to volume overload or stretch due to pressure. This stretch is described as an increase in ventricular wall tension that is due to the pressure and volume overload that occurs in chronic, or not chronic congestive heart failure. Pro-BNP is then enzymatically cleaved to produce BNP and NT pro-BNP. BNP is the active hormone composed of 32 amino acids and pro NT pro BMP is inactive. Measuring either one of these would be appropriate for a workup. Whatever your lab has, it would work because levels of BNP and NT pro BMP correlate both the same to the severity of heart disease. If it's high, your heart disease is not so good. most of this. So BNP is the active hormone and NT pro and B is inactive. The its main job is to simulate the excretion of sodium and water and they are both good at diagnosing congestive heart failure. So BNP it assists and this would also um, work for pro BNP assist in detection of congestive heart failure in asymptomatic patients. So you can run a BMP on someone that you are suspecting could develop congestive heart failure, and then you would be able to treat the disease sooner. Um, it can correlate to the severity of the disease. So that's remember that's the thing we want in enzymes is they're high if the severity of the disease is quite severe, low if it's not severe, or normal, like, really low if it's normal in the plasma. And this can help differentiate between, let's say a pulmonary embolism, pulmonary symptoms, and congestive heart failure. So here's a comparison between the two. BNP has a half-life of about 20 minutes. NT pro BNP has a half-life of one to two hours, so you can detect it longer, but you can, in the serum. BNP can be elevated if the patient is on BNP therapy, so that might be an issue. And NT pro BNP is cleared by kidneys and is falsely elevated in severe kidney disease. Uh, BNP is a good prognosis indicator for acute coronary syndrome. If it's high, then you know your prognosis isn't very good, and there's a chance of mortality. In congestive heart failure, BMP increases with increasing age and decreasing renal function. I'm going to talk about lactate dehydrogenase, but <clears throat> it's not really used at all in the diagnosis of a heart attack. 
It is not specific. It only signifies that there's tissue damage somewhere in the body for total lactate dehydrogenase. It has five isoenzymes that can be separated by electrophoresis. And it lists them here. You have LD1 through five. You have HHHH, HHHM, HHMM, HMMMM, and MMMM. I have never seen anyone order a lactate dehydrogenase isoenzymes. Maybe it happens in adult hospitals. Um, I don't know. My physician friend has only ever ordered a regular lactate dehydrogenase. She herself has never ordered isoenzymes, but she said that could be something a oncologist, an oncologist would order and not necessarily an emergency room doctor. So LD1 and LE2 are found in the heart, the red blood cells, and the kidney. LD3 is found in the lung, spleen, lymphocytes, which are a type of white blood cell, and pancreas. LD4 and LD5 are in liver and skeletal muscle. And then in your serum, you have the most amount is LD2, followed by LD1, 3, 4, and 5. So it does not go in chronological order. And here is an uh, electrophoresis graph of the isoenzymes. So I'm going to go over this, but realistically, this is not something anybody does. Normally, as I showed before, LD2 is more so prevalent in your serum than LD1. When there is a cardiac injury, they flip, and there's more LD1 than LD2. It has a slow rise after a myocardial infarction, which is not helpful in diagnosis, so that's why we don't use it. And levels can persist about five days after an injury, heart injury. So as you can see here, you have your LD1 and LD2, but then when you have a myocardial infarction, your LD2 is higher than your LD1. Okay, so I will talk more about this in the later lecture when I talk about body fluids, but in other uses of LDH, which the one I see most in a pediatric hospital is for cancer treatment, but um, it's an increase in cancer, hemolytic anemia, oh, I spelled that wrong, pernicious anemia and infections. And it can monitor treatment for cancer. If it remains high, then your treatment is not going well. It can also be increased in pancreatitis, acute muscle injury, fractures, shock, and hypoxia, which is a lack of oxygen. The main reason we see this done at Akron Children's is to monitor leukemias. Uh, a patient comes in from the ER, has a really high white count, low hemoglobin, low platelet. We look at the diff and we see blasts everywhere. Usually the doctor will call back and order an LD and do them se for several days to monitor how treatment is going for this patient. And I've shown you similar graphs uh, to this before, but this one here includes LD and the heart enzymes, which I mean, people used to always run LD for heart attacks very long ago, but it just doesn't happen now. High sensitivity CRP. So CRP is normally very low in your serum. It's not floating around. Also C-reactive protein is what it's called. If you have greater than 10 milligrams per liter indicates some sort of infection or inflammation. So inflammation, this can be high in rheumatoid arthritis or any sort of other inflammatory diseases. It's not very specific for what inflammation, but it does tell you that there is inflammation. Um, if you have higher than, if, you're, if your result is higher than baseline normal, you are in, in, could be at an increased risk of heart disease or stroke. Uh, they would do this in an adult hospital just to run and see and if it's high, then maybe you might want to make some lifestyle modifications. Uh, the high sensitive CRP assays stratify patients with levels below 10. Normal is less than one. This part I did not include on your slide, it's very new. 
BNP is also used, we run it on suspected COVID patients in Akron Children's due to the multi-system inflammatory disorder, organ disorder that kids have been getting when they get coronavirus. All their organs get inflamed, it can cause heart problems, lung problems. So when one of these kids comes in, the doctors usually run troponins and BNPs uh, to rule out the heart inflammation or any heart problems. I mean, really don't know what they do in an adult hospital if they do this too, but the, the inflammatory organ thing is very specific for children. So I wanted to add that into this lecture to make it a little up to date for 2019 coronavirus. Uh, we've done way, way more troponins and BMPs than I ever have this past year. And really not too many of them have been high. So that's good, that's encouraging news. High sensitivity CRP is a good test to help identify a patient that has some sort of infection or an inflammatory condition. This is more of a proactive test than to say, um, if someone's having a heart attack, this isn't really what you would run. But if someone isn't having a lot of symptoms, just a little bit of symptoms, this would be a good test for the doctor to see if there's an inflammation somewhere in the body. If it's less than one, it's, there's a low risk of the inflammation. One to three is an intermediate risk, and then three to 10 is a high risk of some sort of inflammation. And the doctor will have to figure out what's going on and then retest once they do treatment. Homocysteine, so the next uh, few slides are based on the pathway of atherosclerosis and how that happens. And these are all products that occur during that process. And if they're high, then there could be some um, plaque forming in the arteries. The homocysteine is a sulfur-containing amino acid. It is a metabolic intermediate and an excess amount reflects decreased enzyme involvement in the metabolism of homocysteine. In patients that have congenital enzyme defects and high homocysteine levels can develop um, congestive heart disease or coronary heart disease. Homocysteine is an amino acid that is formed in the breakdown of proteins. Increased homocysteine levels can lead to vessel injury, platelet activation, and thickening of vessel walls. So like I said, this can lead to atherosclerosis, which you know, follows the cascade and can lead to a heart attack. Nutritional causes of mildly elevated homocysteine include deficiency of vitamins such as folate, B12, and B6, which are involved in the homocysteine pathway. And this can be a screening for patient, patients with heart disease that don't have any risk factors, and just taking simple vitamins can help with this. Myeloperoxidase is another issue in building up plaque. Remember the macrophages and neutrophils come in and this is a product um, inside neutrophils and macrophages, which is then released in inflammatory conditions. It degrades collagen and atheromatosis plaques covered with a layer of collagen. Increased myeloperoxidase causes plaque to become fragile and prone to rupture. And this can be a biomarker of plaque instability. It can say if this is high, then your the plaque in your walls is ready to rupture or cause you problems and maybe lead to a cardiac event. Uh, Lipoprotein-associated phospholipase A2 is also a marker of vascular inflammation. And this one is also found in macrophages around plaques and this is very specific to the vascular region. And increased levels can lead to stroke, a coronary event. If this is high after myocardial infarction, then, then your prognosis is lower. And then you would run this with a high sensitivity CRP. So a doctor might run a whole panel of these tests to see if a patient could be having arthrosclerosis, which would lead to a myocardial infarction, so they can do something before something really bad happens. All right, so that concludes our heart section. So let's stand up, shake around, move around.
Okay, moving on to liver function. It synthesizes proteins. It metabolizes glucose, glycogen, amino and nucleic acids, lipoproteins and drugs. It does hormone clearance. It, it makes cholesterol and it converts ammonia to urea. And it metabolizes bilirubin from the breakdown of hemoglobin. When your red blood cells break down, hemoglobin is released, and then it metabolizes that into bilirubin, which turns that into bile, and you secrete that out your bottom. Here is the internal anatomy of a liver. You can look at that and study that. I don't recall really any anatomy questions on my board of registry, so maybe there were. I don't, it's been a while. Okay, so moving on to the tests of liver injury. The hepatitis transaminases. So if someone has liver problems or even these are done on patients with certain medications that can affect the liver, these AST and ALT would be in a liver panel. So we'll start, um, we have AST, which the old signage is SGOT, no one calls that anymore. Um, aspartate aminotransferase, ALT, alanine aminotransferase. And they catalyze transfer of an amino group of aspartate or alanine to alpha ketoglutarate. AST is found in cardiac muscle, liver, skeletal muscle, kidney, brain, lung, and pancreas. So AST is in a lot of tissues. And ALT is mostly in the liver and kidney. Previously, um, when people would have heart attacks, AST would also be run to determine if it was a heart attack, but obviously AST is not a very specific test. And so it isn't really good to determine if a person is having a heart attack but it's often increased in liver function. So it's pretty good with an ALT to determine how the liver is doing. So if both ALT and AST are increased, that is most likely a liver disease. It is very rare that if both of these are increased for it to not be associated with a liver disease. AST and ALT be normal or discreetly elevated in extrahepatic cholestasis. And severe elevation of AST and ALT in viral hepatitis may be 100 times their normal range. So we don't really see a lot of viral hepatitis in a children's hospital. There is some, but I don't really see that too often. I'm sure in adult hospitals you see this a lot. In healthy people, your ALT is going to exceed your AS2. However, in acute alcoholic liver disease, alcohol induces a release of intramitochondrial AST. And the half-life of mitochondrial AST is really high. So your AST will be higher than your ALT in alcoholic liver disease. And that's called the deritis ratio. So you have three to four to one would be that ratio. And in end-stage liver disease, both enzymes may be low because your liver has been replaced by fibrous scar tissue and there isn't really much liver left to uh, release the enzymes. Test of liver injury, the hepatitis lactate dehydrogenase, which we discussed earlier, is in most tissues of the body and it catalyzes the oxidation of lactate to pyruvate. LD4 and LD5 are in liver and skeletal muscles, and it increases transit lean hepatitis. So they would run, they could run an LD along with the liver panel, but I don't really see this happening very often. Maybe it happens in adult hospitals, but like I said before, LD is not really specific and not too many people do the isoenzymes of LD anymore. So the test of for liver injury, which would be biliary dysfunction, you would run an alkaline phosphatase, 
a GGT, and a 5 prime NT. Alkaline phosphatase is present in the bone, the liver, kidney, intestine, and placenta. The isoenzymes are distinct and are separated by electrophoresis, and most circulating ALP is from the bone and liver. Bone is heat inactivated, so if you were to heat inactivate your sample, the ALP would dissipate if it was from the bone. If it's from the liver, then it will last. And I, here at Akron Children's, we do, uh, we do separate the ALPs, not very often, maybe once a year, we will separate out our ALPs. Um, this is very rare. And the extrusion of the biliary tract will cause an increase ALP. So if your alkaline phosphatase is elevated, you have a differential diagnosis of things that could be wrong. It could be an extrahepatic biliary obstruction. It could be primary biliary cirrhosis, drug-induced hepatocellular cholestasis, or Paget's disease of a bone. GGT, gamma glutamyl transferase, is produced in biliary epithelial cells, and this is a highly sensitive indicator of biliary injury. This one is highly increased with alcohol abuse. So if you had a few drinks the night before, your GGT is gonna be high. If you guys were out partying last night, Maybe we should do your GGTs today and see what's going on. Um, we don't really do a lot of GGTs in Children's Hospital, although we do see patients with alcohol abuse. This would probably be something more useful in a adult hospital. Five prime nucleotide, five prime nucleotidase. This is a the biliary epithelium is the main source and the levels are highest in cholestatic conditions and is useful to confirm the increase in ALP is of liver origin. So if your ALP is increased and your five prime is increased, then you know that that ALP increase is because of a liver and not because of bone or other condition. Here is your take home message. If your GGT is within normal range, then the excess ALP is most likely bone origin. I have a typo there. Just excuse that there. So the diagnosis of alcoholic hepatitis. Your AST is gonna be higher than your ALT. Your GGT is gonna be increased and out of proportion to your ALP. And the level of GGT is gonna correlate with the amount of alcohol consumed. Once you stop, once an alcoholic stops drinking, your GGT is gonna go back to normal levels. Normal levels. Acute hepatitis. 90% 90 is due to viral infections, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, so forth. Um, tra your transaminases are gonna be increased often five to 1,000 international units per liter. And your AST ALT ratio will usually be less than one. ALP may be elevated due to some inflammation and necrosis of bile duct lining cells. And diagnosis of chronic hepatitis, AST and ALT will only be slightly elevated. Chronic hepatitis uh, has a multitude of reasons it could happen. Viral hepatitis B, sometimes people don't even know they have hepatitis B or C or D for years and years and years. Alcohol is definitely a liver killer. Drugs are obviously a liver killer. Don't do drugs. And then autoimmune diseases can attack the liver as well. And it's determined by appropriate testing. You're gonna do, you're gonna do viral markers, you're gonna do autoimmune markers, there's gonna be tissue biopsy. And then obviously if someone is on alcohol or drugs, they're going to run drug screens and alcohol levels as well. In cirrhosis, your liver cells are replaced by scar tissue and your enzymes are gonna fall. Your ALP and GGT may be elevated due to pressure on the bile ducts from the scar tissue. 
um, protein in albumin production is going to decrease, which causes edema. Uh, your production of clotting factors decreases, which is going to cause bleeding. And the conversion of ammonia to urea is going to decrease, which causes brain toxicity when ammonia gets too high. Ammonia is a bad toxin to have in your blood. So you can see here's a picture of a cirrhotic liver and then a normal liver here. And here is a real life cirrhotic liver. And here is a histology sample of a cirrhotic liver. Uh, diagnosis of liver disease, another option, it would be extrahepatic obstruction. So an obstruction outside of the liver in the bile duct. The biliary system outside of the liver can be obstructed by scar tissue or tumor, then ALP, GGT, and 5' prime NT are all going to be increased, but your AST and ALT will be normal. And here is a picture, here is like a rendition of an obstruction in the bile duct, and here is an actual scan of an obstruction. And then there is fulmina, <clears throat> sorry, fulmina hepatic failure, which is massive destruction of liver. Example, Rye syndrome, which happens in children who take aspirin. Never give your child aspirin. It will kill their liver. Tylenol intoxication, ow, ha. We see this a lot at Akron Children's, surprisingly, because Tylenol is an easy thing for kids to get a hold of, mostly it's teenagers. And they will take it, unfortunately, for suicide trying to kill themselves but I, so far in my 11 years here I've not actually seen a child die from Tylenol intoxication it just makes them really sick for a while uh, we have to monitor their coags and their liver enzymes and it just uh, messes with their liver for a little bit and then they usually get better and then other toxins like poisonous mushrooms all kinds of things can cause that liver failure so your AST and ALT be really elevated with a ratio of one to five. You have high serum ammonia, and sometimes patients will need a liver transplant. That's not, not really the case with the Tylenol, but possibly with the other ones. Muscle. CK is most often used now for muscular disorders or muscle disorders it's hardly ever used for heart so crush injuries overexertion drug use this can all lead to uh, muscle degradation which is rhabdomyolysis your ck is going to be elevated your autolase will be elevated and you will have a positive myoglobin in your urine uh, which is tested with a dipstick and it can also be caused by a side effect of lipid lowering drugs. Autolase converts glucose into energy. It's a tetramere of three known subunits, A, B, C, and it has three isoenzymes. Um, this is not specific for skeletal muscle, so it can be increased in a number of things. Use this restart. Maybe not. Okay. Sorry about that. It can be increased in an AMI, muscular trauma, muscular dystrophy, malignancy, etc. But once again, it's not specific. So remember, we're looking for specific tests. it can be used to monitor and diagnose skeletal muscle diseases. However, it has been mostly replaced with using CK. It's a little bit of an antiquated test. Another uh, thing we can do with CK is CKBB is released into the brain following stroke and the elevation correlates with the amount of damage 
and can predict the outcome. Usually if it's greater than 50 units per liter, then it will be death. For, um, isoenzymes aren't really done too often, especially on spinal fluid. Uh, LD is run on very, very occasionally fluids. LD is high in brain tissue and it is most useful in determining if blood in a CSF specimen is due to trauma during the tap or due to true intracranial hemorrhage. You would also know if it's due to true intracranial hemorrhage because the cells look, um, you would have some different white cells that would have eaten the red cells. Uh, but the LD is not elevated in a traumatic tap. So I don't know if you know what a traumatic tap is. So when the uh, physician that's doing the spinal tap hits a vein instead of actually going in into the spinal fluid, or they hit a vein going in, and so sometimes it's really bloody, it looks like pure blood, or sometimes just like a pink tinge. But either way, that's not the best of specimen. The LD can also be useful in determining if the meningitis is due to a bacterial or a viral infection, or I guess a parasite too. If it's bacterial, it's elevated. If it's not bacterial, then it's normal. But now we have this really good test called a meningitis film array that just in an hour and a half, you know what the infection is. It tells you the most common viruses and bacteria in spinal fluid and bam, you know. So this might not do the LD too often. Pleural fluid. Here is a picture of a pleural effusion, which is just fluid around the lungs. Here's a chest x-ray. You can see this is the pleural effusion here. So hydrostatic versus osmotic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is water being pushed out by some force. If there's a lot of water in the blood vessel, it'll get pushed out causing edema or water uh, swelling in the tissues. Osmotic pressure is water moving from its area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. If there are too many particles in the plasma, water will be sucked into the blood vessel, causing the blood pressure to elevate. In a fluid, it is important for the doctors to know if it is a transudate or an exudate. So a transudate is the fluid is a result of either increased hydrostatic pressure or decreased osmotic pressure. And this would, a case of this would be heart failure or cirrhosis or nephrotic syndrome. An exudate would be due to tissue damage. There's an increased capillary permeability and a decreased lymphatic reabsorption. An example of this would be infection, tumor, or trauma. And I actually have a really good personal example of an exudate. My husband's esophagus exploded or ruptured about almost a year ago. And this caused a lot of trauma in his internal organs and it caused an infection. There was a very big surgery involved. And so he had an effusion in his, in his whole, pretty much his whole abdomen, his lungs. There's lots of fluid in there. So that would be a good example of an exudate because he had trauma and he had infection. Transudate is something else going on, but that's, his was an exudate. So if you can remember, like something really bad happening suddenly would be exudate. Here's a chart explaining the differences of transudate and exudate. I think my time is getting long, so you can Look at that um, key thing here is because this is the enzyme lecture is that in transudate, the LD is lower and the exudate, the LD is higher. And synovial fluid, so this is joint fluid, knee, elbow, joints. It is a fluid which lubricates the joints and LD will be increased in rheumatoid arthritis, gout, and failed implants like artificial knees and hips. It will be increased in infectious arthritis, but this is not really currently used in clinical evaluation.
because synovial fluid is really sticky. You think of it as like oil for your joints. So our analyzers here cannot run this sticky fluid. You would have to send this to some special laboratory that has the capabilities of running the sticky fluid. So here is a final chart. You might want to save it. It has all the tissue sources of the enzymes. Here's all the tissues and then the enzymes and what they have in them. Troponin's not on here, but you just know that troponin is heart. Thank you for listening to my lecture. I've enjoyed preparing this for you. I have worked here at Akron Children's for almost 11 years. I've been at Tech for 16 years. If you have any questions about my lecture, you can email me at my email listed here. I work night shift three nights a week, three twelves, so I might not get back to you right away if I have a few days off, but I will get back to you. Or if you don't have questions about my lecture, if you just have questions about being at Tech or anything, whatever you want to ask me, uh, go ahead and ask me. Good luck in your studies and thank you. Bye.